it's always a good day to look at another proof of the infinitude of primes. And today I'd like to show everyone a topology inspired proof of this very important fact. But in order to go through this argument, we need some basic ideas of topology. We won't go super in depth, but after looking at these, you'll be armed to look more deeply into topology if you'd like to. Okay, so maybe what is topology in the first place? Well, in topology, we study the shape of a space via something called its open sets. And you might say, well, what are the open sets? Well, it turns out that there are some rules that these open sets have to follow, but that being said, you can take the same set and define different types of subsets of that set to be open, depending on exactly what you're trying to study about that space. So that's pretty interesting. Some other notions that build off of this are closed sets. So closed sets are merely complements of open sets. And then we have two very important facts, and that is an arbitrary union of open sets is open, and so that means I could take finitely many open sets, union them and get an open set, or I could take infinitely many open sets, union them and I still get an open set. And that union, that infinite union, I should say, could be a countable infinite union or an uncountable infinite union. But we don't have the same result for closed sets. In fact, a finite union of closed sets is closed. And perhaps for some examples, an infinite union of some closed sets will be closed, but you could also cook up some examples of an infinite union of closed sets not being closed. Okay, so maybe the classic thing to think about is the real numbers. And based off of this fact that an arbitrary union of open sets is open, all we really have to do is look at what I'll call the basic open sets. The open sets which form the building block of all other open sets. And inside what's called the standard topology on R, the basic open sets are merely open intervals. These may be finite open intervals, like the interval from 0 to 3, not including 0 and not including 3. These might be infinite open intervals, like the interval from 5 to infinity, or the interval from negative infinity to 4. Or, since these are the basic open sets and we can union them to get another open set, that means the union of the interval from negative infinity to 4 and 5 to infinity makes another example of an open set. And then what are some closed sets in this standard topology on R? Well, it's the standard topology, so we would hope that closed intervals would be closed, and in fact they are. And so the closed interval from 0 to 3, so that includes 0 and 3, is closed. And it can pretty easily be written as a complement of an open set. Like the complement of the open set from minus infinity to 0 union 3 to infinity. And so since that's an open set, we took its complement, we got the closed interval from 0 to 3. That means the closed interval from 0 to 3 is indeed closed. And of course, some other things will be closed as well, like the closed interval from minus one to two, or maybe the closed interval from 20 to infinity. You could have infinitely long closed sets as well. But there are also sets that are neither open nor closed, like for example, half open intervals, like the interval from minus four to nine, where we don't include negative four, but we do include nine. And then there are also sets that are both open and closed. In this standard topology on the real numbers, there are only two, and that is the real numbers themselves, so that would be the set from minus infinity to infinity, as well as the empty set. Okay, so now that we've got the basics of open sets in a really familiar point of view, let's maybe jump into this proof of the infinitude of primes. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is define a topology. And what I mean by defining a topology, I mean we're going to say what the open sets are. So in this topology, we'll be on the set of integers. And this makes sense because we're trying to talk about the infinitude of primes. 
and prime numbers like naturally live within the integers. Okay, so anyway, so on Z, by making, I'll say, the basic open sets, and this has a technical term of being the basis for a topology. Okay, back to this. So our basic open sets on Z will be arithmetic sequences. And I'll use the following notation. So I'll use A sub little a B, and this will be the following arithmetic sequence. So it'll be A n plus B as n ranges over all integers. Okay, nice. And so there's a little bit of work to do that I'm not gonna do here because it gets a little bit technical. You have to check that this does define something called a topology. And like I said, I won't do that here, but perhaps I'll make um, a more in-depth video on the second channel for this. Okay, so anyway, let's look at an example of one of these objects. So maybe A sub five, four. So that's gonna be everything of this form 5n plus four as n ranges over all integers. But I could write those out and see what their structure is pretty easily. Okay, so I'll start in the middle. That'll be the case when n is equal to zero and thus our output is four. If n is equal to one, I get nine. If n is equal to two, I get 14 and then 19 and then so on and so forth. If n is equal to negative one, I get negative one. If n is equal to negative two, I'll get negative six, and then you can carry that backwards as well. Okay, so that's an example of our arithmetic sequence. And then before we move on, I'd like to point out that these are the basic open sets, which means a general open set is a union of these types of sets. And it could be a finite union or it could be an infinite union. Okay, so now I'd like to point out we can make the following observation. The whole set of integers can be written as a union of these A type sets pretty easily. And this is maybe motivated by the fact that the equivalence classes mod n partition the integers. That's exactly what's about to happen right here. So notice we have A50 union, A51 union, A52 union, A53 union, A54 makes up the whole integers. And like I said, you could think about this as the equivalence class of the integers mod five. So these are all the integers that give you a remainder of zero when dividing by five. These give you a remainder of one, two, three, and four. But notice there are no overlaps between these sets. This is an important thing. So I can notate that there are no overlaps by putting a little dot here. That means what I have is something called a disjoint union. And now, like I said, what's weird about this setup is one of these basic open sets is actually also a closed set. And we can see that as follows. So notice that this bit right here is most definitely an open set. That's because it is a union of four things that we called our basic open sets. So I'll call this maybe U, the canonical letter for an open set. But then let's notice that this thing is also open. Well, that's pretty clear. That's actually one of our basic open sets. Okay, but since we've got a disjoint union there, we can write A54 is equal to the complement of U. Well, that's exactly what we mean by having a disjoint union when our whole universe is the integers. Oh, but if I've got the complement of U, which is an open set, that means indeed this thing is also a closed set. Great. And I'd like to point out real quickly, this does not mean that every open set is a closed set because we could build some open sets that are arbitrary unions of open sets, but the arbitrary union doesn't maintain the closedness here. Okay, so now that we're kind of warmed up with the universe that we're working in, let's start working towards this proof. So of course what we want to prove here is that there are infinitely many primes. 
And we're going to do this by way of contradiction. So lots of proofs that there are infinitely many primes work towards a contradiction. And this is also one of those. Okay, so let's by way of contradiction, suppose that all of the primes are on the following list. So P1, P2, P3, so on and so forth up to Pn. So I've got n total primes, but no more. And now let's take some integer k, which is not equal to plus and minus one. And let's just point out that k is an integer here. And let's notice the following. So note that since k is not plus or minus one, it must have a prime factor. But since we've only got finitely many prime factors, well, it's one of these prime factors. So in other words, we can write k as m times pi for some um, i between zero and n. Okay, great. So now where do we go from here? Well, I'd like to point out that if k is equal to m times pi, then that means that k is from the following basic open set. And that's the basic open set a pi zero. So let's just recall what that looked like real quick. So that looked like this. That was everything of the form pi times, well, we used n before, but we're using n right here. So maybe I'll change this to a capital N just so that I don't like reuse the index. That means I need to change this to a capital N as well. And now we're fine. So this is pi times n as n ranges over all integers. Well, definitely our k is of that form. So that means k is in that set. But look at what we've done. We've shown that every integer that is not plus or minus one is in one of those sets. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, that means that the following set is, well, equal to the union of all of those sets. Okay, so let's write that down. So let's write down, well, I'm gonna write down all of the integers except for plus or minus one. So I've got like minus four, minus three, minus two, zero, two, three, four, so on and so forth. And then that is going to be equal to this a p one zero union a p two zero ending at a p capital N zero. Again, how do we know that? Well, we took some random person from here and it had to be in one of those sets by this argument that's just above. Well, I guess that shows that it's a subset. Well, how would you go in the opposite direction? I think that's pretty clear. I'll let you think about how the opposite direction would go. Okay, but now let's look at what, we've ha what we have here. So let's notice we could write this as the complement of the set containing negative one and one. So this is negative one, one complement. But now let's notice that this is a finite set of these basic open sets, which actually turned out to be closed sets as well. But since that's a finite union, well, that means that maintains the openness and closedness. So that means this collection here, this union collection is both open and closed. Okay. But in particular, we want it to be closed. So that means the set containing minus one to one complement is a closed set. Okay. But being a closed set means that you're a complement of an open set. But if we take the complement of this, it just goes away. And we see that in fact, this doubleton containing minus one to one is an open set. But that's where we come into an issue. So let's recall that our basic open sets were arithmetic sequences. And as we said, every open set can be made of a union of those arithmetic sequences. But remember each of those arithmetic sequences was definitely an infinite set. Oh, but this only has two elements. 
So since it has two elements, it can't be written as the union of some sets with infinitely many elements. So that's where we get our contradiction. And what did we contradict? Well, it must be the assumption up here that we have finitely many primes. And now let's look at where it really went wrong. And that would be right here. So in fact, if we you know, look at the true fact, which is there are infinitely many primes, then this union right here would be a p1 comma zero union, a p2 comma zero union, so on and so forth. We would have an infinite union. But an infinite union of closed sets may not be closed. And in this case, as we saw, it's not closed because that leads us to our contradiction. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.